looking at policy and seafood in that. And so Marine Protected Areas is right in the center of everything that we do at the CFFO. But um, we haven't actually put our volunteers through a training program on Marine Protected Areas, so we'll, we're right where you are. This is our opportunity to figure out how do we want to go about doing this. We have Marine Protected Areas out here, and we have volunteers that are aware of them. But the vast majority, even though they live right here, have not heard of it. So this is the challenge that, that we have today, really, is that, you know, we perhaps don't talk about it very much, we're in the know, and then we have volunteers that are in the know, and maybe they're not even aware of them. And then you get visitors from maybe two miles inland that have never visited the ocean and have heard of marine protected areas. So, you know, it's a huge challenge about getting the message out there. And so we're going to talk this morning and this afternoon about how we go back to our home bases and figure out how we're going to do this. So let me first figure out who's in my audience, because I'd like to know who I have. So how many of you uh, on the ground, working either with volunteers and staff and interpreting out there with, with the real people, the real world? Okay, that's most of you. And then how many of you are maybe training people that are out there, but they're not out there yourselves? A couple of people? And then who, if you haven't, if you, yeah. so if you haven't put your hand up, what are you, what are you doing that's different from those kind of things? Well, actually doing the interpretation myself, not training. Okay, so you're doing the interpretation. Is anybody not covered? Yeah. As this case, educating school children. Okay. The most important job there is. Um, I'm one of the stakeholders for the South Coast region, and so I'm kind of. Ooh, you're a spy. <laughs> <laughs> to 
in marine protected areas without it seeing like a huge leap of faith and to find ways to naturally connect the things that you normally do with these protected areas, but only if and when it makes sense. And the reason I say that is because at the aquarium, a few years ago, we said to our volunteers, we really need to have more conversations about conservation. And the volunteers were like, oh, I don't know, that seems like preaching, and I don't know if I'm comfortable about doing that. And what we, over time, showed them how to do was that there are moments when it's, it seems more obvious and easy to go that little bit extra, to go from talking about the abalone and sea otters to some conservation issue with sea otters or maybe over-harvesting of abalone or something along those lines. If the visitor's receptive and if they're willing to, to engage in that conversation with you. And there are other times it doesn't make any sense. I'm showing them my gumbo chitin shell I found on the beach. It looks like a butterfly and that needs kind of like a backbone. And for them, for me to go off into some trajectory about, well, you know, in the marine conservation area, we're finding that these are now three times the size they normally were, and the fecundity is much greater than it ever was. And, the, and, and they're like, well, can I have that? What is it? <laughs> so you've got to find natural ways to do these things, to bridge these gaps, and to connect with people through their senses, which is the way we all learn about the world around us. So give them things they can touch, they can hold. Um, you know, is there some seawater they can taste? Can they feel what a piece of kelp feels like? How do you get from this to a marine protected area? And how do you get from you know, a tiny piece of kelp to a kelp forest? It kind of seems ridiculous. And it's easy for us here at the aquarium. Because I can go stand in front of the kelp forest and say, here's my marine reserve, go be that. Uh, you know, here's all the species you could ever imagine. And you can see the kelp forest and you can see the communities. People out there see brown blobs floating on the water. They think it's a sewage spill. You know, they have no idea what's beneath the waves. A piece of kelp, you can, you know, if you talk about forest, everybody's seen a forest. This is a leaf from the forest. If I show you a leaf, can you picture a tree? Can you picture a forest? Can you picture habitats and different ways animals interact? You usually can. And so this is the way human brains work. You know that we need to think of something we already know and connect it. And then, so how can I identify things that people are already familiar with? And you just did that session with Jim about tangible intangibles of you know home and food and survival and all those things. But then take that to things that people already know about. And we can talk about these communities and how we might want to protect a community. The other way is for me is to have people think about animals. So, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about sea otters. They're the reason I moved to California. They wouldn't come and move to England, which is inconvenient. And the commute was ridiculous. So, um, you know, I spend a lot of my time thinking about sea otters and talking about sea otters whenever I can with visitors. And, but, you know, for some people, and I, I don't understand why, this is not their favorite animal on the entire planet. And so, but they, have, they do have a favorite animal. And it might be a very distant, remote animal from here. It might be a tiger that lives nowhere near the ocean, nowhere near a protected area. But most people know that tigers most likely are found in reserves these days or in a national park of some kind. And I may ne ever, never go to India and see a tiger in a reserve, but I know those reserves are set aside to protect tigers, which are important to me, in the same way that sea otters are going to benefit from marine protected areas. Now, it's slightly different because, of course, there's no fence around marine protected areas. My sea otters may stray across the dotted line and they may wander into other areas, but surely they're going to benefit from areas set aside where wildlife can do the thing born to do and for communities to, to, to regrow and for biodiversity to come back and all of the things that sea otters need because of course that's their shopping mall, that's where they go and look for all that food they need to eat for their survival. So I might find ways to link through that. Um, you know, some of us at our sites probably have a lovely piece of whale baleen. Now that's kind of a a stretch because I'm never going to persuade a whale to stay in a marine protected area, you know? And, and it's hard for something, so this is a piece of gray whale baby. Well, they don't even feed here. They feed up in Alaska. But to know that these animals are traveling through protected areas is going to be meaningful to people. In the same way that people think, you know, if I'm on the highway and I'm going a long way and there isn't a bathroom stop, 
then I'm in trouble. Well, that's my marine protected area, isn't it? If I drive down from here to LA and I need a 7-Eleven, I need a Coke, and I need, I need the party. That's my marine protected area right there. That's a special place to me. And so the fact that these animals swim through these areas that are protected, where the wildlife is doing everything it was ever intended to do, is going to matter and resonate with some people. So there are different ways to tell these stories. Here at the aquarium, we might go in via our seafood watch pocket guide. So, you know, there are lots of species on these lists that either benefit from marine protected areas or would um, be impacted if we didn't have marine protected areas in some way. And so we might encourage some of our volunteers to find some of those stories, but only when it makes sense. Because when you make a big leap or you go beyond when someone's willing to listen to you, then you've lost them and you've wasted that opportunity. And maybe you've had a meaningful conversation about something else. So I really encourage you not to feel like every conversation needs to be about marine protected areas and that every person that comes through your facility has to go away knowing about it. Because if you did that, you probably missed all of those teachable moments with other things. And you've also maybe missed the opportunity to engage with them at a deeper level. Because that's what we definitely find with our visitors here at the aquarium is that these, what maybe seem like shallow conversations to, to some of you and for your, for your volunteers that maybe know an awful lot, is a springboard in for people to start to explore in their own way. And it's very different for every one of us. Every one of our visitors is going to have different learning styles, just like you do. Some are going to need to touch things, taste things. You know, some people are going to need to stick their finger in my water and go, wow, salty. I didn't know that was salty. I saw a boy from Salinas step off the bus to come on a school trip here to the aquarium. Salinas is 17 miles inland. He'd never been to the ocean before. And his first observation as he walked up to the edge of the deck was, wow, I didn't know it made a noise. You know, and so for many of us, because we're immersed in this, we, we make these leaps of faith that people know about all of these things. You know, not everybody may know that salty or that I just consumed, you know, half a dozen tiny marine organisms. They may not want to know that, right? <laughs> but we can never make assumptions about what people know and don't know. And so knowing in your, who's in your audience, like, I mean, I only did that in the briefest possible way, but, you know, where are you from and all of these things will make a difference to the conversations that you're going to have because you'll know if it's appropriate to go that next step. <coughs> what are they interested in? What are they interested in outside the realm of the ocean? Some of you maybe have, has anybody, has anybody at a place that's not directly connected with the ocean? Maybe a historic landmark or, no? So you're all some way connected with the ocean. Well, we do land conservation, but mm -hmm. we're going we're gonna to show people from the sheltered sea because it's the, the conservation of the ocean that's adjacent to land. Right, parks. so you make that land sea connection. Right. right. So, you know, depending on your, where you are, it, it may make sense to just talk about the ocean in the broadest term of things. I really encourage you to think about marine protected areas on that really basic level when you're going to go back and train your volunteers because some, some of the science that we heard is overwhelming and can start to get confusing. And um, I know the woman from the Channel Islands said, oh, well, I, you know, it's difficult. My visitors don't understand the difference between these different types of protected area. I, don't, I wouldn't even encourage you to get into any of that. I think that's way too much in the weeds. It's way too much detail. Unless you've got your fishing rod or your scuba gear on your back, it's not really going to matter to the individual. What matters is that California has done something really incredible, and it's recognized the need to put things aside that we can't mess with. Because, you know, our species loves to mess with stuff, don't we? We're constantly experimenting with this wonderful planet. And we're figuring out different ways to do things. And if we break this over here, could we fix it by doing this? Could we dump lead in the ocean? And could we do these things? And so, I forgot the last track of what I was going to talk about. I have no idea where that was headed. I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was very meaningful and you all needed to know. Um, so, yeah, it encouraged people to think about the basic reasons why we have marine protected areas. And maybe you don't even use the word marine protected areas. If, if they don't go away not knowing what the acronym MPA stands for or MLPA, that's really okay. Because we just need to know that it's set aside and have people think about what do they know that's similar to that. You know, you're going to have visitors that have been to Yosemite or Yellowstone 
And if they haven't been, they've seen it, and or they know someone that's been, and they may want to go, and they may never get there. They may be, you know, maybe they want to see the Great Barrier Reef, but they're never going to make it. But they know it's set aside, so that should they ever have the time or the money or the opportunity, they'll go, and it will be exactly as it was promised in the brochure, right? It's exactly what you get, and that's what we're, that's what we've had the foresight to do here in California. So it's really for us about making the most of sharing with people that we've done this amazing thing. That we're going to be this model for people to come and see. Uh, this is how we did it. We did it with a cooperation of scientists, and we got everyone on board. We got stakeholders to agree. We got people to come to the table and agree on the best way forward for all of us. And that all of us isn't necessarily the users and the stakeholders, but the other stakeholders that couldn't speak rockfish and the squid and the grey whales and the sea otters. They didn't have a voice in this, but we were thinking about their needs, which is quite unusual for us species, isn't it? Because usually we think about, you know, how many of these squid can I eat be before I get sick, rather than what do the squid need to survive out there? And perhaps they need some safe places to go hide out where you and I can't turn them into calamari. So I wanted to um, have some time for questions or thoughts or if anybody has any concerns, we're going to have a session at the end of the day that's going to give you an opportunity to start planning how you might do this, because we all go on workshops and seminars, and, and we fill our heads with all these things, and we're all like, yay, and then you get back to your office, and reality sets in, doesn't it? And look at all these things I didn't take care of because I've been gone, and these things can kind of drift. So we're going to give you some time at the end of the day to think about, okay, I've learned all of this. What do I want to then pass on to my staff, my volunteers? And what ultimately are the messages I want my visitors to know? And what are the props and tools we use already that we can make a natural segue and not a forced conversation? Does anyone have any concerns about how that might work where, where you're based? Yeah, I have a quick yeah. question. I'm kind of curious about the word stakeholders. That seems to me the toughest thing to describe as a stakeholder. You know, uh, yeah, and I, it's, it's jargon. So yeah, we should we should, we should make sure that one of the things as we go back is that we strip all the jargon out. But in the process, you know, stakeholders were people that feel like the ocean belongs to all of us, and here's how I use it. So I dive in it, I fish in it, I swim in it. Um, you know, I um, pick things out of it. I work on it. I, you know, I run a whale watch vessel on it. All of these things, all of the uses that we might have as, as humans for the ocean, and all of these people came together to find uh, a way to set pieces aside that wouldn't necessarily threaten people's livelihoods, or with some give and take, of course. But no, you know, with the argument of MPAs knowing that if I can't fish here, then there may be more fish comes out of this resource. But that's probably getting way too detailed for, for the average person. I mean, I think it's. It, and obviously, you will be a better trainer and educator if you've absorbed all of this information, but that doesn't mean to say you necessarily need to pass it on. That, that's a skill in itself, because it's it's really easy, having been in this lecture format, and here I am doing the same thing. So we've, we've lectured for a day, and now here I am pontificating in front of the room, and then I encourage you to go off and then pontificate to your people, who then, guess what, they stand in front of the visitor, and who really just wanted to know what is that? We've got the life history of abalone. And you know, everything that they even didn't want to know about abalone. And they only wanted to know if it was a shell or not. You know? They weren't even asking, is that a marine snail? So just um, finding ways to take the information that you've had and then make a meaningful interpretation session out of that with your with your staff and volunteers when you get back so that they don't end up lecturing on MPAs. Because let's face it, it's not the most engaging subject in the world. I hate to say that, but I run the Ocean Action Team here at the Aquarium. So we do the online advocacy thing. And usually it's a cute, fuzzy beastie that needs your help. It's like, oh, look, you know, he's being caught by the long line. It's not horrendous. And people are like, oh, that's terrible. What can I do? And then you go, OK, now I'd like you to protect this marine protected area. And they're like, oh, that seems dull. And it, because it's not connected to anything that we know anything about, 
I'm not saying why that's important, I'm just saying, it, you know, here it is, it's important. And this is why you've really got to make these connections with the things that people already know. And then, if you have time, and you, there's a handout actually in your binder about some of this. I mean, the handout suggests that you go from the things that you can touch and taste, maybe some of you have videos you can play, you have maybe vocalizations of mammals and get people hooked in. You, know, you have different learning styles that come to, to your site. There are people that are only really going to learn things by doing things. So, you know, are there games they can play? Other people are going to need to hear what the humpback whale sounds like and then understand what kind of food they eat because this seems pretty meaningless. A piece of an animal is sometimes meaningless to people. So what analogies do you have? What metaphors do you have? One of the volunteers at the aquarium insisted on bringing a sieve into where we interpret marine mammals. Because to say that this is a sieve, it's not like any sieve any, anybody's ever seen at home. So they were like, why don't I bring in my sieve from home? So they did. And people make that connection. Because we don't understand how this could possibly strain tiny little organisms. But we understand that when we're making pasta and we have a sieve at home, it drains the water out. So we get that. So, you know, looking for those simple things. And then one of the things in here is talking about how you take all these multi-sensory outcomes and then we're really good with these big brains we have about imagining things, aren't we? We can, if, it, you know, you and I could pass this cup around, we could all feel the kelp and we could think about forests and we could all go off in our virtual submersible right now into the kelp forest with some help. You know, I mean, we could do that a lot easier than the average visitor. But if you give them the sensory inputs, you can transport them to these underwater worlds that they're never going to go and visit. And if you have school groups and you have the time for this, you can really go off on these little exploratory expeditions and see, you know, what's it like to be an octopus on the sandy seafloor and going around the rocky reef and have the kids really think about what's important, what are the basic needs that these animals have, and then why is it important to protect it? And when you're in that habitat and you're thinking like one of these animals, then it's going to be a little more obvious. Now, is the average visitor going to let you do that? No, because they, you know, they have somewhere else to be, and they only wanted to know where the restroom was anyway. So you don't have time to take them on a journey. But if you have groups that you work with, then you might try some of these techniques that are in your hand out. Do you have a question? I was going to say, or it seems easy to do this when you're talking to people who may not all be going out to the ocean or fisherman or something like that, how do you how do you speak to them and without, you know, raising flags or Yeah. Know. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because your next session is all about that. So you're actually gonna go and do a session about conflict resolution. Um, here when we when we encounter those here at the aquarium, I try to recognize and I, I've encouraged the volunteers that I work I work with to recognize that you may not ever be able to find common ground, but Karen's going to help you try and look for ways. And one of the biggest conflicts we run into here at the aquarium is that people see these in our touch pools, and this is the favorite thing that they ever ate. And then these pesky guys came along, and now I can't have these. And so my favorite animal is suddenly under attack because people wanted to eat this. Now, how do I control myself? <laughs> you know? But I want to actually, you know, hit them over the head with my abalone shell. But what? I, but but instead, what I might do is I probably cannot dissuade them that the sea otter probably has a more of a right to eat this than they do. So I'm not going to even try going down that route. So what I'm maybe going to talk about is the different feeding styles of sea otters and how they have learned behaviors and what <coughs> all of them eat abalone, and that when we wiped out sea otters for their pelts that, you know, they used to be more abalone, so we've got used to having abalone, it's become an item for us, but I'm probably not ever going to dissuade them that this is more important than their right to eat this. And so I'm going to look for other opportunities to talk about other things. So there is a kind of a bit of a Sarah Palin where I'm not really answering that question, but I'm actually going to go off over here and answer the question I didn't want to answer. But I'm going to look for an opportunity to maybe give them a little bit of education about the animal that I really care about without trying to get into direct conflict. But marine protected areas is even more tricky really than trying to go between a sea otter and an item on your menu because you're talking about people's 
livelihoods, uh, people's historical rights to, you know, my great grandfather fished here and his father before him and his father before him. And so those are those are different and Karen's gonna address that. But you know, sometimes just deflecting people away from something or just acknowledging. You know, it's okay if, if I've never eaten abalone, but if I wanted to pretend I have and said I found it really yummy, perhaps I would. Or that I knew uh, you know, I always at the aquarium on the seafood watch pocket guy farmed abalone was a good choice. And then talk about maybe farming of abalone and feeding kelp and you know, just kind of divert them off the contentious subject because after all they're here to have fun if it's the average visitor. You know, they weren't here to be lectured at and they did pay twenty five dollars to come in and have a good time. <laughs> so I'm probably not gonna want to start beating them on the head with the abalone shell, but just hope that we, between us we maybe find some common ground that we have about abalone, which is that they're good to eat and there are some good choices. And um, you know, maybe you can leave us the ultra out of the picture. How am I doing for time? You're good. Three minutes. Anybody have any other thoughts about taking this home? Yeah. Just one of the things that came up from the regional stakeholder before we did this whole process was that a huge percentage of the state population thinks that everything was conserved before. Yes. And so you dis not dissuade that, but to say that it wasn't, we protect there are an analogy for on land parks to protect there. So again, there was this misperception the sanctuary protected everything, or the state parks protected the whole ocean. But it's, I don't know how common that we're going to have that misperception. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very Transition. good point. I, I think it kind of, that goes hand in hand with the fact that the vast majority of people out there don't know that there are issues in the ocean at all. So you've got a group of people that think, well, it seems to be okay. You know, so people are surprised that this is necessary because everywhere they go, they see Chilean sea bass and they see Atlantic cod. So how can it be in trouble? Because everywhere I go, there is, there's more of it, right? It's on every menu, and the price isn't $100 a fish. And so, and, you know, we're used to a supply and demand economy. So, um, you know, a friend of mine took their pocket guide in, and they saw Atlantic cod in the counter, and they, and they said, oh, I hear there's not many of these left. And the guy said, no, it's okay, I've got 10 boxes in the back. <laughs> so, you know, most people are not aware of the issues in the ocean. And partly because they think it's been protected in the past, partly because they think we're a civilized, sophisticated nation and we'd have, we'd have everything figured out, because we have, you know, we have time to go and figure out what everybody else in the world is doing, so we must have figured out our own issues, right? <laughs> so lots of people don't know that there are issues with pollution or overfishing or all these other things. And then what they do here is, oh, you know, this area's being set aside, or this is a sanctuary, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. That, that sounds amazing, right? So, it, to, you have to be careful that you don't completely tip people into a negative way of thinking, that you don't paint this picture of, you know, the world's about to end in 20 seconds, because the chances are they switch off then. So what you have to do is gently tease out what they know and what they've heard, and then, Try and find a way to massage that into the real truth. But it, I, to tell someone straight out that they're wrong is always the worst thing you can ever do to any, anybody, any visitor. You know, it's like, oh, I, you know, I, I, I heard that um, the ancient abalone um, used to eat this with a knife and fork, and you'd be like, well, that's preposterous. And but actually, I may learn something because actually, if I say, well, that's very interesting, I never heard that story. Why didn't you tell me about that? And then they tell me that they've read this book, and we talk about a book, and we get into some conversation. And over time, they may come to the conclusion that what they heard was a load of rubbish based on some information that I gave, but without contradicting that information. And so I think the same is true with this, is that we can say things like, you know, you think that sanctuary would mean total protection. It has that connotation about it. And when, what, you know, what... When, when I say the word sanctuary to you, what do you think? You think of a safe haven, you think, so you'd perhaps be surprised to hear that these things are allowed in a sanctuary. And so that you can lead people into that exploration of themselves. People always like the answer they discovered for themselves. You know, that's the big key, is that they want to touch things and feel things and figure out, you know, why is long lining dangerous? And then you show them the hook and they're like, well, okay. So, you know, figuring it out for yourself is always key. So lead people down the path and direct them a little, but let them come to their own conclusions. Steve? Yeah, I just 
wanted to make a, a couple points. One is, you know, I've been working with the seafood watch card here at the aquarium since when it first came out. And when it first came out, you know, if people didn't understand the reason why, and you got into sort of, you know, not very long conversations with people. And now, almost everybody who comes in, their question is, oh, is this the updated one? You know, and they, they want to tell you stories uh, about it. So, you know, we're only in the beginning of the dialogue. We're just at the beginning of the dialogue. And the other point, and I do a lot of work at Point Lobos, and we, we did a, a couple of walks with a lot of the docents out there. Not a single docent mentioned, as you're walking through this amazing area, that that's all protected out there. I mean, so the beginning of the dialogue is fairly simple. It's, look at that. That is all protected. I mean, just to point out and to develop a pride that we have here in our community of what we've been able to accomplish. I think, you know, over time, we can start getting into deeper conversations, but in the beginning, it's that's protected and good for us. And you know, aren't we proud of what we've been able to accomplish? Um, and wouldn't it be great if the rest of the state was protected and further up the coast is protected? And with that note, we've got to head over to Hopkins. Okay.